Hello, this is Vijay Rana from India Briefings. With me today is Rajesh Jain, who is the pioneer of uh, internet revolution in India. And he also played a critical role in 2014 elections, bringing back Prime Minister Modi to power. Rajesh Jain, if we see at the world today, the world is passing through an unprecedented economic crisis. The hospitality industry is virtually decimated. Cities are closed. Unemployment is rising. Where will it end? It's uh, great to be on your show, Vijay. Thank you very much. I think what's very clear is that uh, uh, the coronavirus uh, essentially uh, has played a devastating uh, impact, has had a devastating impact globally. Uh, uh, pretty much every country has been deeply impacted. And I think the bigger impact is happening in uh, countries like India. Uh, uh, which have not been uh, wealthy enough uh, to actually uh, even do a, a large-sized fiscal stimulus and put money in the hands of people. So really, if you think what's happening, because economic activity has been curtailed uh, because of lockdowns, because of uh, the fear factor that's emerged in people, uh, there is less spending that's happening. And because there is less spending, the revenues for companies go down and uh, jobs get impacted. So if you've seen layoffs happening in many parts of almost all parts of the world. And that in turn feeds the deterioration of consumer demand. And uh, that's, I think, uh, the real impact which we are seeing, uh, where uh, countries are then set back in their growth prospects. Uh, India will probably grow at maybe sub 10%, uh, lower than 10% uh, uh, this year. And just to understand the impact of something like this in a country like India, uh, if someone was earning 100 rupees, uh, they would have expected their incomes to probably become 110 or so uh, in growth. Now, when the country as a whole grow, goes down by 10%, and we have not seen these kinds of numbers for a very long time, the people in the bottom of the pyramid, the bottom half or the bottom third, they are impacted much more. So they probably will see the 100 becoming maybe 75 or 80. So think about that. Instead of seeing 110, they are seeing something like 80. And that has a huge impact on, on people's lifestyles. And uh, you know, it pushes people who are in the sort of lower middle class back into poverty. Uh, and that's really what we should all be very concerned about. Now, the crucial question is, we know how deep the crisis is. What can Modi do to retrieve the situation? Yeah, so I think... Uh, India in the last six months uh, has uh, probably been one of the uh, most badly affected uh, as the numbers have come out uh, for the April, May, June quarter uh, in terms of almost all, uh, very, most of the countries globally. It was because uh, the lockdown started very early and it was very, very severe. Uh, that's not really helped as much because India today has the largest uh, uh, number of cases uh, globally uh, on, on a daily basis. Of course, the deaths are low, uh, but the cases have been rising and that impacts economic activity. So the question on what can government do? I think the number one priority for the government has to be to put money in the hands of people. I think once people have money in their hands, because like we just saw, uh, the economic activity has been impacted, people's incomes have fallen. In India, especially, uh, a lot of migrants who are working in urban areas have gone back to their uh, villages. So instead of earning higher incomes in urban areas, they are effectively getting uh, probably a subsistence income back in the rural areas. And this has to change. So the government action has to be looked at from two angles. One is of course from the health side. I think uh, from the health side, uh, I think uh, the prime minister should actually um, repeatedly be telling people to take the basic precautions, masks, some amount of social distancing, uh, hygiene when it comes to washing hands on a regular basis. Uh, these are things which need to get repeated again and again and again. That's what people's actions have to be. And then we have to increase, of course, the testing, et cetera, all of that. Now, on the economic side, I think what's very important is, like we just discussed, we've got to put money in people's hands. And for a government which 
actually has been constrained because of its fiscal challenges. Uh, growth is of course low, so tax collections will be lower. The question necessarily therefore comes, uh, what should the government do? And I think there is one specific idea which uh, uh, I'd like to suggest uh, to the prime minister that he should look at, um, which is Dhan Bapasi. Now, it means essentially wealth return, and it has two sides to it. Number one is monetization of public assets in the country, the surplus public wealth in the country. And I'll, I can go into more details as we go forward. And the second is that wealth which is generated should be returned to Indians. My estimate, just at the top level numbers, the public wealth of Indians, the surplus public wealth, which is locked up today in minerals, land, and public sector undertakings, and so on, is roughly $20 trillion. That comes to nearly $70,000 per family. I think what the prime minister can do is essentially start monetizing that wealth and give every Indian family, every Indian family, nearly $1,500 every year for the foreseeable future. Now, there are multiple benefits for something, of something like this. It will not, uh, it, it, there are no bad side effects. Everything else has side effects, either it's inflation, either it's ratings, uh, 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 or there are taxes which go up, etc. This is actually one of the best policies which can be done because it's not going to have impact on, there are no side effects of something like this. So in a way, think of it as a very good treatment um, for the economy, for recovery. Just as we wait for the vaccine, this is actually a treatment for the economy. More importantly, because it puts money in the hands of people, it will get the economic cycle of jobs and prosperity going. Because as people spend the money, companies will now start hiring people, production will start going up, and uh, can, <coughs> excuse me, economic activity starts to increase. And that is what the country needs at this point of time. Yeah, this is exactly what Abhijit Banerjee, the Nobel Prize winner, uh, economist was suggesting a few months back. So where will this money come from? How can they monetize, uh, as you said, the public resources? Yeah. So it's very important to understand that where is the wealth, surplus wealth of India locked up? And I'll give you a very simple example. Uh, take Lutian Delhi. It's prime area, prime real estate. Uh, it's basically a British era legacy. Uh, there are a few thousand bungalows um, uh, which are essentially used by government uh, uh, ministers and bureaucrats. And um, uh, they live in lavish lifestyle. I mean, every house there is probably worth uh, hundreds of millions of dollars. No MP anywhere in the world, whether it's America, Germany, Japan, or Britain, lives in that sort of luxury as our Indian MPs live. You are absolutely right. Because... When the British left, the new Indian rulers simply moved into their homes. I mean, there was talk of really uh, converting, that in, converting that whole area into hospitals, into uh, commercial areas, etc., where economic activity happens. Okay. In most countries, like you rightly said, Vijay, uh, MPs are basically given an allowance and they have to go find their own accommodation. We have basically just taken the British Raj and extended it to British Raj 2.0 by giving these kinds of uh, lavish uh, bungalows to people. If you can actually start monetizing that, that itself is worth hundreds of billions of dollars. And that money can then start getting returned back to people. Now, what will happen? How, so if you go through the process, what happens? There is this area where people from rural India want to come to cities in India because that's where prosperity happens. That is where economic activity happens. India needs to move a large percentage of its people who are locked up in agriculture into manufacturing and services. Manufacturing and services happens in urban areas. That's really, that's why the wealth generation happens. The income levels go up. Now, all of this uh, area in Delhi today is, is really uh, 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 wasted effectively. So people come to Delhi, they end up living in slums because all of this Lutian's Delhi area is just uh, locked up for a handful of uh, ministers and bureaucrats. Monetize that, auction that, let's get residential buildings done, let's get commercial uh, places uh, going, office complexes, 
educational institutions, hospitals, everything that generates economic activity. And that's just one example. Did you know that there are 65 Indian cities which still have army cantonments in prime areas in the cities? I mean, there is Navy Nagar in Mumbai, there is Delhi cantonment right in the heart of Pune, in Bangalore. You have all of these properties. I have, in my childhood, I have lived in Mathura cantonment. What a lovely place it was compared to the rest of the city. Correct. And there is, but there is no logical reason after 1947 to have cantonments in the middle of cities. I mean, these were canton defense establishments built by the British to safeguard the cities. Navy Nagar in Mumbai was built in 1796. So there are many such examples, if you take, of public wealth. This is where public wealth is locked up in the country. India needs to get economic activity going, manufacturing going, services going. Now, there are many other things which are required. You need ease of doing business. You need lower taxes. A lot of other things are required. But the most important thing is start creating areas and cities where you have commercial activity. Because this is wasted uh, land, which is there. The other big area where government has a huge play in India are in the, in the public sector undertakings. The government, like even the prime minister had said uh, early on in his campaign in 2014, the government has no business being in business. And yet, uh, there are hundreds of billions of dollars locked up in public sector undertakings. Start monetizing that, put the money back in the hands of people. This does not require printing of money. This does not require taking uh, additional borrowings, which all have side effects. This is unproductive assets, which when they get back into circulation, they drive economic activity. That is the way to creating jobs and prosperity in the country in a very uh, rapid period, uh, rapid uh, 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 time frame. I can see two criticism uh, uh, being leveled against your suggestion. One criticism will be the environmental degradation. And the second uh, will be that only the rich people can afford to buy properties or to, to live there. So there will be a lot of public resentment that, the, uh, that if prime minister takes your suggestion that Modi is selling country to the rich. Uh, do you think these ideas are politically tenable? So, First of all, let me address the criticisms and then I'll come to uh, 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 the other elements of these ideas. I think the ones who benefit most when jobs are created, when economic activity happens, are the poor. Today, what is really happening in the country? You have nearly half of the country doing agriculture. Because there is no other place. They can't sell their land. Uh, they can't get out of it. It's subsistence agriculture. Uh, the rules that we've had in India since the 50s have really locked people into, into a negative spiral, essentially. 50% of India effectively produces just 15.15% of the GDP. By contrast, 2% of Americans are engaged in agriculture. So unless we start moving people out from agriculture, India is not going to see productive growth. It's not going to see incomes rise for people. So that's the first point. Now, where does productivity uh, increase when people get into manufacturing and services? Where does this happen typically in cities? Because that's where you have the benefits of agglomeration. Uh, everyone living together, that's the power of cities. That's, I mean, our parents probably grew up in villages, but they all moved to cities. They migrated to cities. Whether we like it or not, 400 million Indians are actually going to move from villages to cities in the next 15 to 20 years. But what is the life we are giving to them before? It's a life of slums because there are no titles to the property. They become political uh, tools, basically, of the, of the parties which are there. Now, when there is prosperity happens, when there is growth happens, the poor get lifted up. The poor, instead of just earning maybe a substance, subsistence income of five to 10,000 rupees, now can look at 25, 30,000 rupees. In every country, the focus does not need to be on the inequality between the rich and the poor. It needs to be, how wealthy are my poor? How rich are my poor? You are never going to create prosperity by making the rich poor and therefore saying, oh, we are trying to create an equal country. We have to lift the people at the bottom of the pyramid. 
And for that, they need to move away from agriculture. They need to move away from rural areas. There are hundreds of Indian cities and towns where the investments need to go in. That is where, uh, uh, while Delhi is, of course, one example we took, there are lots of towns in India. And this is naturally happening. Every city expands, whether we like it or not, because people are coming in some of the rural areas, start, the edges at the periphery start coming into uh, and come, coming with becoming part of the city. So I don't think we have to worry about what will happen to the rich. We have to look at the positive impact of what is going to happen to the poor in the country. And that is the transformation India needs. Coming to the size of India's population and the size of the country as a whole, haven't we failed to create new cities? I don't remember after independence, perhaps we have built up only one new city called Chandigarh or maybe Noida or Gurgaon. So doesn't India need more cities and modern cities at, in, rather than expanding the old cities? In fact, you are absolutely right. It's a combination of both. The growth in existing cities will naturally happen. But a lot of investment has to go into new cities. In fact, did you know that the BJP 2014 manifesto actually talked about the creation of 100 new cities? But with the passage of time, that 100 new cities became 100 cities smart. with free Wi Fi, smart cities, like, right? Then with free Wi Fi, and then with free Wi Fi at railway stations and existing cities. That's what needs to change. We need 100 new, 100 or more new cities. And in fact, just think about it. If we can embark by creating the, by monetizing public assets, the, the surplus public assets, which are there, the money comes in. In fact, on the back of the wealth that is actually locked up in these public assets, we can even borrow from global markets. Um, because today you have trillions of dollars in the world actually sitting at zero to negative interest rates. India needs the investment. China grew in the 80s, 1980s, and 1990s on the back of international investment. That's what India needs to do. So building out the infrastructure in cities is a, is a fantastic idea, and that's what we need to do. One criticism uh, of the Indian economy is the corporate sector has not contributed to India's growth the way they should have done it. Rather, and they have been benefited disproportionately. Is that impression right? Um, I would put it this way, that really what has happened in, in, and there are I think two ways to look at this. So what has largely happened is that for the most part since independence, the corporate sector has been shackled. Okay, we had the license permit quota Raj in the 60s and 70s. Um, um, we had uh, bad uh, um, policies essentially through almost till 1991 which really put constraints, labor laws, land laws, capital uh, laws, which were there, which really limited the growth of the, of, uh, of, of the corporate sector in India. In fact, one of India's uh, prime ministers, I think also said that uh, uh, it's not good for making profits. I mean, corporate should not be in that business of profits. Now, once you start looking beyond that, Narasimha Rao's reforms of 91 carried forward by Vajpayee, uh, to a large extent between 98 and 2004. And I think then again, we lost some momentum over the last uh, 15 odd years. So I think what needs to happen is India's corporates have to be freed from government interference. Now, what do corporates want? They need an educated workforce. Okay, that's number one. For that, we need to free up the education market in India. India's education market needs to be free entry free market, basically, very important. So there's competition that creates better value for, for parents and for, for most importantly for students. Taxes have to be much lower. Uh, the government and the recently has taken steps to reduce the taxes for new businesses, but that needs to apply to everyone, even greenfield projects which are happening. Can we get India's tax rates to sub 10%? No country, very few countries have this kind of low taxes. This will attract global investors. We have a huge domestic market, and that is what we need to take advantage of. Then we need to free up, of course, the agriculture sector, because that's again starting to happen, but more needs to get done. So India's corporates, I think, will start playing a much, much greater role in India once they have 
a growing domestic market once they are unshackled from the huge restrictions uh, that are still imposed in many segments uh, uh, in the country and i think what needs to also the other extreme of what what needs to also be prevented is basically crony capitalism where the government is seen to be favoring a few uh, industrial houses or a few business groups the government's job really has to be to ensure a level playing field for businesses get out of business and i think indian entrepreneurs as they have shown globally are very very good create a conducive atmosphere uh, domestic in the domestic market and i think you will see a tremendous change in 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 growth job creation and indian entrepreneurship in the next uh, decade that is the path to creating prosperity in india what's the hope in near future how do you see the trend in say in next 6 months or a year i think the next 6 to 12 months are going to be very difficult unless the government takes some immediate measures uh, we are all debating what letter the recovery will take you know from v to w to l to now even k and all kinds of letters i think what needs to happen is that the indian government prime minister should actually bring in credible economists and there are a lot of very high quality talent available globally who want to help uh, in india's uh, economic uh, uh, development going forward i think the number one thing is we need to get the best advisors without external talent okay it's not the bureaucrats bureaucrats are 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 uh, status quoists they are risk averse this is the time i had written in one of my uh, essays on my blog uh, that india needs a war cabinet okay uh, you need to get the so we need an economic cabinet effectively get the best talent there are many other countries which have gone down the path of prosperity let's learn from them the best ideas from what china did what south korea did what singapore did uh, what hong kong has done and we realize that one of the key elements in all of that is economic freedom give economic freedom give freedom to people freedom to farmers freedom to individuals freedom to businesses and that is the change i think if if the prime minister can do now this is not the time to think uh, uh, incrementally this is the time for disruptive for very bold thinking and it's a moment in time which is passing us by every month that we delay we are going to extend the the downturn and we are going to hurt prospects for tens of millions of indians and subject them to a life where we are pushing them from sort of lower middle class into poverty and that will be very bad we will undo gains of many many years if we don't do something like this along with of course tan wapas rajesh jain thank you very much indeed pleasure talking to you vijay thank you